Dear everyone, welcome to the International Women's Day here at BI. We are live here at Finn Øyen, Campus Nydalen, at Oslo. This is a day of global celebration of the social, economical and political achievements of women. A day where we celebrate women, gender equality and recognize female achievements. A lot has changed the past centuries. Women can now vote, stand for office and own their own properties. But this did not happen overnight. The right change occurred gradually through tireless f f efforts of brave women and men fighting for what is right. This year we want to look into women's journey to the top management positions by addressing the year's topic, Dare to Seize Opportunities. That's right, Gloria, and this is a very important day. That is why we have invited you to celebrate with us. This year's topic is Dare to Seize Opportunities, because that is what you should. You should dare to seize all opportunities. We know that the share of female top managers is still low, but we also know that some women have reached the top. So, how was the journey and the external barriers on their way? And was there any kind of inner resistance for taking on a top management role? That is a few things we want to ask some of the Norwegian top managers based on the former president of BI, Tom Kolbernsen's research article, Female Managers Ways to the Top. During this live talk show, we will hear several stories by top managers positions and their journey. Constance, you have already interviewed some women in various top positions. Le uh, can you tell me more about it? Yes, that's right. So I had a talk with Tone Trøen, the president of the Norwegian parliament, and Elisabeth Kloster, an entrepreneur and businesswoman. Tone told us about the importance of these positions and how the government celebrates today. This year marks 100 years with elected women in the government. Elizabeth shared her thoughts about the upcoming woman, the importance of female entrepreneurs, and the rest you'll just have to wait for. Let's take a look and uh, watch the video with Tone Trøen. Yes. Vi står på Lønnebakken foran Stortinget, fordi vi må nemlig ta en prat med Tone Vilhelmsen Trøen før kvinnedag. Tone er stortingspresident i Norge og innehar derfor Norges mest høystrangtede stilling til Kongen. Nettopp derfor så lurer vi på hvordan hun stiller seg til denne rollen, veien hennes dit og hennes syn på den kommende kvinnedag. Kom igjen! Nå har du vært stortingspresident siden 2018 og er kun den andre kvinnelige presidenten. Du innehar derfor en rolle som er både viktig, men du blir automatisk også et forbilde for jenter og kvinner i mange andre typer. Hvordan føles det? Føler du deg som et forbilde? Nei, egentlig ikke. Men jeg er veldig opptatt av at jeg og jeg er ydmyk over den rollen jeg har, og den oppgaven jeg har fått, og det ansvaret jeg har. Så jeg er stolt over det. Men nei, det er ikke helt meg å stå her og kalle meg selv et forbilde, altså. Nei, jeg skjønner det. Men her du er da, forventet du å komme hit, og hvor startet du? Nei, jeg forventet jo absolutt ikke å bli stortingspresident, og du kan si det politiske engasjementet mitt, det startet lokalt. Det startet med at jeg... Jeg var opptatt av idrett og drev med idrett og trente barn i idrett og syntes det var veldig dårlige treningsforhold i den kommunen jeg vokste opp. Og var veldig høyt og tydelig opptatt av det. Og ble etter hvert fanget opp av lokalpolitikken. Så jeg stod på liste til valget første gang i 87. Det er lenge siden. Åh, spennende. Jenter som vil inn i toppledelsen. Om du så er inn på politikken, næringslivet eller idretten. Har du noen tips til dem, eller noe du vil si til dem? Jeg mener det viktigste er å tørre å si ja. Si ja til oppgaver du blir spurt om å ta på deg. Og det er det andre som har sagt før meg, men husk at når noen spør om du vil ta på deg en oppgave, så har de vurdert at du kan det, og at du er regnet til det. Og så tror jeg vi må være litt sånn tøffe og tenke at ja, det er ikke sikkert jeg kan alt ved dette her, men det kommer jeg til å klare, bare jeg får muligheten til å prøve. Og når vi gjør så godt vi kan, så får vi det til. Så våg å si ja. Man snakker mye om viktigheten rundt et støtteapparat, karrieremessig. Hvor viktig har det vært for deg underveis? Det er klart at det er jo viktig for oss alle, tror jeg, å ha noen vi kan snakke fortrolig med, noen vi kan støtte oss på, og kanskje få litt avlastning hos innimellom. For meg har det selvfølgelig vært familien min og mannen min. 
Men jeg tror også det er litt viktig å tenke på at livet har litt ulike faser. Så jeg har også hatt faser hvor jeg har trappet litt ned. Og det er ikke dermed sagt at alle karrieremuligheter eller muligheter går fra deg for det. Så det å våge å kjenne litt på at livet går i faser. Noen ganger så må man kanskje ta det litt mer med ro, og så kommer man sterkere tilbake. Tusen takk, Tone. Du er, jeg sier det, et forbilde. Og så er du en veldig mange kan lære av, tror jeg. Men, Finndagen, har du noen planer for 8. mars? Ja, klart jeg har planer for 8. mars! Det som jeg synes er veldig spennende er jo at vi er tre kvinner i Stortingets presidentskap. Det består av seks totalt, og tre også er kvinner. Så den dagen så har vi litt sånn kvinne-takeover, så vi er bare kvinner som presiderer, altså leder møten inn i Stortingshallen. Vi feirer nemlig 100 år i år med kvinnelig representasjon på Stortinget. Åh, det er så kult! Og så skal jeg, jeg skal reise litt, men digitalt da. Sånn som det er i disse dager. Det er nesten litt, ja. Ikke sant? Så jeg skal til Alta og snakke om 8. mars der. Og så skal jeg også delta på en debatt som idretten arrangerer om likestilling. Og jeg brenner jo for likestilling og likerepresentasjon. Veldig spennende. Tusen takk. Like måte. What an inspiring interview, Constance, you had with Tone Trøen. Now, we will have uh, the research presented by Tom Colbjørnsen. Tom Colbjørnsen is economist and sociologist and the former president of BI and also professor. Tom has extensive experience as a researcher, lecturer, business consultant, and has also led and participated in several governmental appointed committees. He's a sought-after lecturer and seminar leader in business world and has collaborated with several large companies, uh, including SAS, Telenor, NRK, Hydro, Kripos, just to name a few. Tom has collected thousands of old vinyl records, and now he's contributing to, uh, to a new book about vinyl history. Tom has written several research papers, and he will now present his research about female's journey to the top positions. Welcome on stage, Tom. Well, good afternoon. Thank you for the for the nice introduction. Um, one minute there, I was feeling I attended my own funeral, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I really appreciated the nice, uh, the nice words. Uh, the issue I'm addressing in this uh, short introduction is uh, what uh, are the success factors for women who want to become CEOs? And uh, if you look at the research, there are actually two traditions addressing this issue. The first one, and that's the most dominant, is very pessimistic. It uh, basically emphasizes on all the, uh, put attention to all the barriers that uh, women meet on their way to the, to the top. For example, stereotypes about uh, female managers lacking capabilities or little willingness in the company boards to hire CEOs. But uh, recently another approach has also started to emerge. And th that approach takes take as um, start with the position that uh, we have to uh, acknowledge that the the um, attitude toward the female CEOs has really improved during the last uh, 10 to, to 20 years and uh, for many big firms for example have set up special programs to support women who aspire for top positions so now the research have started to ask maybe the problem is not so much the barriers but the women who hold themselves back and not use the opportunities they do have. So the, um, you could say that uh, the criticism of the traditional approach is that it has uh, looked too one-sidedly on women who have not succeeded. Instead of, as the more new research has started to do, look at what success factors have made it possible to reach the top. And it's the last uh, tradition that the report I'm going to present here has been uh, done in. So I should, as I said in the introduction, I shall uh, 
present a project I did in 2017 where I interviewed six female CEOs on behalf of the Employers Association Spectre. Some of you may, may know that organization. And the six CEOs that I interviewed all managed large state-owned firms with a very high visible profile. They are, of course, not representative for all female CEOs. And there is, of course, limitation to what we can learn from them. But nevertheless, I think it's interesting to know about their histories. And I think definitely there is some inspiration to get from knowing how they reached the top. I've concentrated these success factors in six, uh, six points. And the first is uh, hard work. And what characterizes these women when you talk to them is that they emphasize that doing well in business has primarily to do with hard work, having ambitions, having strong intrinsic motivation, and not least on sharp results on what results you produce. And these women, characteristically, they don't think only about their own careers. All that, all of that, of course, is important. But they are really there to make a difference. The job is also about, you know, a, a mission they want to achieve. One of them worked in the health sector, and of course, they had as a kind of mission they really want to improve the health sector. Another worked in transportation, and you know, they really wanted the <laughs> trains to be there on time. So uh, they acknowledge the hard work that comes with the CEO position. And uh, that it's a kind of uh, a lifestyle. To take a CEO job is a kind of lifestyle in terms of hard work. And you have to be at the disposal of the press, of the, other, of the, uh, the board, etc., etc. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and 365 days a year. So we really have to acknowledge that there's a big leap between number two position and top position. There's one thing to move from the middle manager to number two position, but a really big step where you really change your kind of lifestyle. That's when you move into the top. And that I think you can sum up in terms of hard work, commitment, wanting to make a difference, kind of lifestyle. The second success factor is that um, it, it, they emphasize the importance of making their, both, both themselves and their results visible. They have made, su made sure that their work and results were publicized. And when they, have, when they had good ideas, they did not hold back, but made their voice heard. If they had managers who neglected them and tried to hold them down, they didn't stay on and just to quarrel with the manager. They changed job. And it was a very clear signal. If you don't get the kind of room from your top, your closest manager in your work, get another job. Don't stay there to try to fight them. And um, also, they advised that you should be aware of um, the not letting your colleagues steal your successes. Most of them in this area emphasized the uh, importance of courage. And in that sense, very many pointed to the importance of their own parents. And every one of them, I think, stressed that as children, they had, have, have, had all been told that uh, it's not, you can do whatever you do. The issue that they were, were girls, it was never an issue. It was never mentioned. The only thing one talks about is that what, what do you want to do? What do you, where do you think you can make a contribution? So they got, was very encouraged for, by their parents for, for building their own courage to, to do whatever they like. But um, they really had one strong advice from their parents. And that was, whatever you do, work hard and work well. Uh, the third uh, success factor is uh, the following, that when offered promotion, they did not stop themselves by asking what they lacked to perform well. Instead, they also looked for how their competence could make a difference. You have probably heard about all this research showing that when a man and a woman is presented for a job opportunity, the man thinks, okay, where can I use my competence here? While well, the woman much more often ask, oh, I lack comp where do I lack competence for not being able to perform this job? That's a very typical observed uh, difference. 
So they made it, thought it had been very important that they, of course, did think need time to think when they got the kind of job opportunity, because it involves CEO, CEO responsibility, etc. And as I said, it's a kind of change in lifestyle. But uh, they also said that very easily, very fast, came to the next step, where they thought about, okay, from what, from my experience, from what I know, from my competence, where can I, what can I really do? What can I, re what kind of makers can I really do in this job? And that kind of courage is very, very important. So um, they thought that instead, from, instead, instead, instead of withdrawing from the competition. Uh, you should try to fill the holes in your own competence. And of course, they emphasized very much the importance of strong networks in that sense. Some of them have had a permanent mentor, and especially one of them had a, <laughs> had a very publicized relationship to, to her mentor. But uh, other <coughs> some of these other people I interviewed, they said that this thing about the permanent mentor maybe isn't the right thing for everyone. I think also it's a very, the important thing is that you have someone to discuss to, someone who challenges you, etc. But also someone who supports you. So that was number three. Number four, they did not let the fact that they are women influence their careers. In fact, one thing that surprised me was that as far as their work situation was concerned, they had not thought much at all about the fact that they were women. So they didn't look upon themselves as some kind of women making uh, <coughs> that, that they were especially important because they were women, etc. No, they didn't think much about that. They had very much respect for women who historically have made the way for, the, made the way for them in terms of making uh, increased, uh, increased the chances of, of female managers. But themselves, they were very much aware that you shouldn't think much about that you are a woman. Think about what you can contribute. Think about the results and show the results you make. That's the way to approach this, according to, to them. And um, to, the, to the extent, <coughs> excuse me, none of them had experienced the many sexual stereotypes that had been used against them. They had been, they had received distasteful comments. Not necessarily sexual, but, uh, and it was not so much related to gender, but more caused by colleagues, both male and female, who were jealous of their successful careers. So that was the kind of, you know, distasteful comments they have achieved. Not uh, sexual harassment or anything like that, but uh, more, who do you think you are? You know, you're more the Jantelov, as we call it in the Norwegian. Number five. The CEO had managed to find a reasonable work-life balance. A CEO job, as I said previously, is all-consuming in terms of time and attention. And if you give your CEO job your little finger, it takes the whole hand. I mentioned earlier that it is a 24-7-365 job. And to avoid burnout and uh, exhaustion, uh, it's very important that you set limits for your work involvement. And the important thing is you have to do that yourself. No one else will do that for you. And especially when you are on that level, people don't think that, okay, now I think we shouldn't bother her because she needs to rest. No, they don't be behave like that against the CEO. They uh, have strong expectation that the CEO should perform all the time. So uh, you have to make some kind of shelters around yourself to be able not to be burned out or whatever. And uh, also doing a top job as a kind of um, CEO has very much to do with uh, attention, being able to give top attention to your job. And of course, if you get burned out and exhausted, you are not able to uh, have very, let's say, solid attention on the kind of work you're supposed to do. So these CEOs that I interviewed, they uh, did all emphasize the importance of having activities outside the job, hobbies, someone like to sail, 
and all they like to get home from work and set the stereo on top level and dance around with the children with the crazy movements and you know whatever whatever it it took to take their minds off the jobs and one should be very careful about that and number six last but not least work and family life must be combined of course that's an as aspect of work, of work life balance but uh, they emphasized very much this importance of having a well working family life and uh, when i asked them after the interview was over if you of everything we have talked about what would you say was the most important thing that you have done that uh, has made you into ceo i chose the right partner that was the answer i chose the right partner and the, one of them said i chose the right partners but <laughs> should not have delved into that and um, so the and that it is raised the issue very much about sharing housework homework of course but most of all sharing responsibility for raising the children that's extremely important for the female managers that i that i interviews and they had found different ways to do it and it was very important there is no one way of organizing a two career family that fits all they all had different models for how they had how they had set set, set up the um, uh, the, the arrangement with taking good care of the children etc et and they emphasize that the most important thing is that they should make the children happy that was the primary success factor of the work family thinking if the children were happy and you know that well adopted in their lives then it was all the time they have to spend with the work didn't represent such a problem but in periods when they had some problems with the children's life etc then it was much uh, that was then what was the problem was arrived so uh, some some mentioned that they sometimes had uh, received criticism for not taking sufficient care of the children that their career had taken so much of their attention from their children that uh, they were so to speak it was implied that they were not good mothers and the imp what is also said was that the important we haven't got that kind of criticism from men it's women who always accuse us of, uh, of that all the women and they said that uh, to you know be able to fend that kind of and that comment is very hurting and to be to be able to fend that off then you are it's very important that you have a very good uh, well working relationship in your family at home so that was the six uh, six points uh, there is a report that has been written about this that i guess you can maybe get from uh, the um, arranger of this yes that's the nodding here so um, what i have done here is just to take out the main main points of the success factors that these uh, women made and uh, that had made them into successful uh, ceo so i hope that um, you have got some inspiration from uh, from this and uh, wish you good luck in your own careers thank you very much thank you tom kalvrimsen for wonderful presentation and your inspiring words in order to reflect upon tom's research on women's journey to the top position we have invited four inspiring and empowering women to this talk show let's see who they are As you may see, I am so lucky to have a panel full of wonderful and beautiful women here besides me. Uh, together with those women, we will talk about Tom's research on women's journey to the top position. Let me present Cecilia of Latum, consulting leader of Deloitte Norway, Janneke Tranås Marino, is senior vice president 
of Private Market and Customer Experience at Yancidia, Ingelin Dröpping, Director Division Regional and Business Development at Innovation Norway, and Ellen Maria Bjerknes Nygo, CEO of the niche consulting company Gnist Technology Advisors. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I was wondering if you are able to tell me a bit more about yourself and who you are. El Maria, do you want to start? Yeah. Thank you very much and congratulations, everyone. It's so nice to be here today with you guys. Um, yeah, I'm Ellen Marie. I uh, have a decade of experience from uh, technology and management consulting companies, large international ones. Before I decided one and a half, half years ago to go on my own together with some other co-founders and form a new company called Gnist Consulting. Uh, we have uh, been going on for one and a half year, and we are now uh, 14 people, and we grew by 400%. That's what you can say when you have a startup <laughs> through the pandemic. Yeah. Janneke. Yes, uh, my name is Janneke Tranos Marino, and I have um, I have three kids, three girls. So happy Women's Day <laughs> <laughs> to my girls. And uh, uh, I have been working in uh, banking and finance for about 15 years. Uh, I've been working in oil and energy and in telecoms and consulting. So I've been a bit around, but most of my career, I've been into different various positions in the finance industry, which uh, when I started was uh, almost uh, very male dominated and top level management. Today, it's a lot better. Interesting. Cecilia. Yeah, I am, am uh, as you said, head of consulting. Uh, I started my career at uh, University, Ullevål University Hospital, working in finance and um, the financial department there. So, and actually throughout my whole consulting career, I've been kind of following the public sector and the healthcare sector, uh, a part that I have very dear to, <laughs> to my heart. Uh, but for the last two years, I've been the leader of uh, the consulting here in Norway, and I also have responsibility in Europe. It's something we call people and purpose, making sure that we take care of our people and do the right thing, also when no one is watching. Uh, previously, I had a career as a sports politician, being a snowboarder. I was also the president of the Snowboard Federation for several years. And I don't know, I have twins like Ellen Maria. And I, I forgot I, my children. I, yeah, <laughs> forgot children. I have three. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when I was home, I was, was actually a bit bored, so I started writing a blog. But, um, uh, so, uh, but now they are six, so I mainly focus on them, not so much on the writing anymore. <laughs> Ingelin, and who are you? Ingelin Dröpping is my name. Uh, I spent um, most of my working life within product and technology in various large technology companies. Uh, my very first job was actually to look for submarines in the Nordic Norwegian fjords. We didn't find any, but, uh, but that was a very interesting way of starting work. I don't have any daughters, but I have two boys, and I made it my quest to raise them in a way to, <laughs> to be good husbands and good partners, as Tom told us about. Uh, recently, I started in Innovation Norway, uh, and that's my first introduction to public service. Before that, I've been in large corporations and also more, almost 20 years beside my work uh, for companies like Telenor and Kongsberg. Uh, being a board, board member and chairman of various uh, small companies. And that um, as sort of um, difference between large corporates and small companies has been very rewarding to me. You have broad experience, broad knowledge, and also you have different top positions. In that case, I was wondering what kind of obstacles do women face reaching top managers' positions versus men? <laughs> Did you want to start? I can, if I want to start. I think, personally, I think so, yes. But I want to hear your stories on what kind of obstacles you have probably faced. And you already mentioned some of it, uh, Janneke. Yeah, well, I think it depends a lot uh, on the context because the public and private sector is different. Uh, metal industry is probably different from mm. fast moving consumer goods. Mm. And uh, I think functionally also it's a big difference whether you are into to HR or you are into um, to uh, align uh, position in the first place. But uh, I'm a technology optimist and I'm also an optimist on behalf of women. So I think that uh, most ob obstacles can be overcome as long as you want it and you're able to build the platform. 
So, uh, so the obstacles I've seen is, of course, that at a top level of a company is very often men recruiting, and they tend to recruit their people that are similar. You know, uh, the bulletproof way is to find someone with the same blue shirt as you have yourself, and the same CV, and also maybe the same school. Um, so that's, of course, one uh, one thing. Uh, I think also that a lot of women have not been able to broaden their expertise enough to have line positions and uh, big sales budgets or or um, top line uh, responsibility. And then they're probably not fitting the personas that normally are recruited for top management positions. So, and then there are the stereotypes, of course, that uh, might hinder um, the prejudices against how a woman is in a leadership role and how a man is, which is very often quite similar in my experience. I remember when I graduated from this school, from BI, and being a, I never thought of being if I was a girl or a boy when I started working. And then it took a while before I could actually see some of the differences that I could, that I could see going up the levels, that it was more men than women. And I represent the tech industry, which has had a lot of focus on diversity the last few years, and we can actually see uh, there's results coming. But uh, f for me, it was a lot of having the consciousness, because there's a lot of unconscious bias there. For me, that has been, because I have never felt anyone stopping me, but there has been uh, both myself, but also uh, things around me that I have had to re raise my hand and say, uh, because sometimes no one asks you. So you have to say, I want to do that. I can do that. And when I understood that uh, the, the consciousness around these topics were extremely important, that was kind of a, a deal breaker for, for me. But why do women encounter these obstacles? Is this actually due to institutions or is it due to that women doesn't dare to seize those opportunities and doesn't dare to go for those positions or take those opportunities? I think it's very much a mix. It's like no silver bullet. Um, I think that one of the things that I think we have experienced is kind of the attitude of the society. And Tom mentioned it a bit in his research around if every time if I go to a children's birthday, actually normally the mothers, oh my God, you're working so hard. Poor you. And you're a twin mother as well. <laughs> Uh, so it's kind of constantly like questioning, am I really, am I really good enough for that? Or am I doing the right things? And the other thing is that, as you said, El Maria, like a good role model and just kind of, as this me meeting is called, due to seize opportunities. I think very often uh, when people are asked to take part in debates or taking on some shoes that are a bit higher, for some reason we time to question ourselves, mm -hmm. do I really do it? So to have someone to talk to, to discuss someone who like uh, pulls you a bit and push you a bit, uh, could be a way to actually deal with some of these obstacles. And who has been uh, the person that you have talked to in those situations? Well, I have a very specific uh, example. It was uh, a couple of years before my, the position I'm in now was going to be open. Uh, the CEO at the time was Lundgoy. Uh, we, I remember very well, uh, and I hope she's fine that I'm <laughs> sharing this story with this little group. But uh, we had a breakfast, uh, and she said, well, she said, Cecilia, things will happen over the next year. So now you get your act together and think about your career. And I was not in a core position. Mm -hmm. And um, we did some changes, and then I was like a part of the game. Mm -hmm. So actually, and yeah, so she's kind of, she didn't say much, but she said enough to make me start thinking. And I think also some of the things that we uh, we tend to not be so good at maybe is to manage expectations. And we put so high expectations on ourselves and our ability to make things flawless all the time. Uh, and and all these expectations and all, all these requirements that we put upon ourselves to, to manage everything perfect at any point in time. I think when we really start to, to look into those things, it's it make us pause before we actually grab those opportunities. And that pause is sometimes mm. that just little, little thing that make us slightly uncertain. And um, yeah, it, um, I remember very well another story. I had my two boys uh, doing cross country skiing. And, uh, and every pre-Christmas there was this market where you should bring something homemade. 
and that and I read this email too late, of course. And it was uh, this was on 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 Monday, and the the, the hand in was on Tuesday. And I was oh my goodness. And uh, what I'm going to do? Well, I'm going to bake some cookies and I'm going to wrap them nicely. And this is homemade. And I we ended up and after the workout, I came in and handed over this box of biscuits that I thought was fantastic. And this um, person heading this market said. Thank you very much. It was last weekend. <laughs> and I, I was thinking, yes, absolutely. Perfect. And you get this, this, this so a hopeless feeling. And then my 10-year-old said, you know, mom, I really like those biscuits. Let's have them ourselves. But sometimes you, you, f you get into these situations and you just, you just have to say that, okay, I do so many things. You can't be perfect everywhere. So we had some very good biscuits over the weekend. All of you have families and you have uh, managed to climb to the top positions uh, on, uh, on your own, but also by help um, with other partners, coaches and so on. And, but how can we also increase the proportion of women in top positions in the future and so we can get even more of uh, such people as uh, you? I think uh, Madeleine Albright actually put words to it and she said there's a, a special place in health women that doesn't help each other. And I think that is something, the most important thing that we can do is to actually create that order of magnitude that... Uh, that makes it um, easy to actually help each other. Because today, many of us, we are, we are few. And as you said, it's easy to pick mm. like ones. And there's too few to pick among. So I think one of the most important things we can do is actually to, to help each other. Mm. Mm. And I think that the companies can do a lot by being very structured, have a structured approach to diversity, to set very clear goals and to, uh, uh, what did, um, I've heard a, lot, a number of times that, you know, the management role is not so mystical that you might think when you are not in it. And uh, to tell the stories about, you know, ordinary people are having these roles and uh, make the, um, the threshold uh, lower. Uh, and I think that when you set a goal, you also have to measure the effect and you have to ensure that uh, there are rotation opportunities that people can come into position mm -hmm. and be on the field when uh, the opportunities arise. So I think the structure, structured approach from the companies will help a lot. And uh, when women have uh, good uh, role models around, it's a lot easier to take the leap. I really agree to that. And uh, that's been a topic for the last uh, couple of years, every woman, International Women's Day, but you, 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 you get what you measure. So if you really want to have a more diverse workforce, you also have to put numbers on it. So, but personally, I think that you can <laughs> experience that uh, female top managers or leaders are also just humans. Uh, to, to me, has been a clear uh, seeing Cecilia taking the leap on the top of the load consulting. I did it in a much smaller uh, scale, though one and a half years late after that, they, uh, you, and it, it matters. It, it really does. When uh, I thought, when if she can do it, I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the slogan, isn't it? <laughs> Just have to want to make a very quick comment about numbers mm. and the goals, because I think every company has to kind of find out where is the loophole. And very often we have sponsoring programs, we have mentoring programs, and then you have a bunch of middle management hiring only senior men. Mm. So. Uh, I'm very fan of data and data-driven decisions. So to make really sure to understand for your, from in your company, where is the real problem? Mm. Um, that, at least for us, it was a kind of awakening when we started analyzing um, our issues. I think also, as you mentioned, Cecilia and Janneke, it's we need to also empower each other uh, in female positions because it, there is a need of sharing those stories and those good stories about how women in top managers' positions have been able to be where they are and also to Im also inspire other young people. Because I'm, to be honest, I'm uh, right. I'm uh, almost 25, and I'm uh, I want to have a top manager position sometime. But then I'm thinking always about okay, but 
there's some obstacles uh, on the way. I want to have a family. I want to do this and this and this. And there's always some sort of maybe a hesitation, if um, we might say so. But do you feel that women uh, hesitate to seize opportunities to become executives or to become top managers positions? And what do you think the reason is for that? I get really sad when you say that getting a family is an obstacle because that's what you, that's we need to stop saying uh, saying that. I I get yeah I really get sad because it's not it's an an enabler and it mm. makes you a better leader and I I, um, I first had I have three boys I forgot to mention them I love them very much of course um, and second time I I was uh, pregnant with uh, twins and and I. I was thinking, how is this going to to end? And uh, and I was also thinking about starting this company. And then someone told me that as long as you can get energy, as long as you do something that you love, and uh, of course you love your family very much, you get different kind of energies from those two places. So I feel that it's made me it's made me a better person. It's made me a better leader, and it actually it actually also made me create better results financially. So it's not an obstacle. Gloria. Of course it's not. It, of course it's not. <laughs> I, I'm really looking forward to have my own family. But but it's like if you're thinking about it, and st especially those times, and I'm starting to reflect a bit, and then I feel like it's uh, some time limit for me as well uh, to able to manage everything at right time at uh, the right speed. But yeah, no, I I can make a comment. I have been working uh, for many years also in in a US environment. I was part of a, a managed, senior management team there. Uh, and also lo often a lot of hosting events and, and uh, dinners and such. And uh, very often very curious on how Nordic businesswomen were unable to, to succeed with family and everything. And so down second in the, in the second glass of red wine, the same question always came. Uh, how do you manage all of this? And I started to tell, oh, it's, you know, we, we do, we share housework, we, we collect children every second day, and this works super. And the same reaction came every time. And that was that they felt very sorry for my husband. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and, and I think that was a very interesting, <laughs> interesting um, uh, conclusion because they couldn't in any point in time put themselves in our in my husband's position mm. uh so i think that what we what we do in in our choice of partners but in in the framework that we have in in scandinavia is is really unique and and that um uh that um team mm. that you create with your family is really, and I think that's the same for men as it is for women. You need a well-working team. Mm. And, uh, and um, I think young, young boys of today, our sons, when we bring them up, they will choose a partner that actually pull things together with them because the, uh, the responsibility of being a sole provider is, is super stressful. Mm. And uh, and when it comes to to I remember you you said so what what is the uh, the thing about working hard I think one thing is is working hard and I remember my father didn't say work hard and and all of that he said I I expect from you that you actually use your abilities and that you're able to provide for yourself and I think that is the most important thing that we actually can teach our girls they have to be able to provide for themselves mm. because that creates that independence that they allow them to choose there is a need to speak up and to share those stories and that is also why i think this evening and this talk show is so, so inspiring to dare to seize opportunities to also listen to your stories on family on your journeys to top uh, positions but have you encountered any obstacles in your career, careers and how have you handled it? Well, I remember when I got into um, this big uh, organization and I was uh, appointed the marketing director at the age of 30. I didn't have much experience and I felt it was two big issues. 
and I was into two different management teams in the matrix. Uh, one was with a lot of women, like 60-70% in the marketing division. And then the other was a line uh, management group where it was 10 regional directors and middle-aged men. Mm. And uh, they had everything to... They were sort of very keen on their local uh, business uh, and they were a king in the regional business life. And I was coming in there to, to introduce a multi-channel model that will take away much of that power and centralize it. And, uh, and uh, then I was thinking, okay, how do we, uh, how do we uh, go uh, move on here to, to sort of um, appreciate what they're doing and everything that is happening in value creation locally in these regions, at the same time show them that if we do things differently, it can create even more value and you'll be happy, uh, you know, two years ahead. Mm. And, uh, and what I had to do then was to, to try to sort of just... Be a, be a nice colleague, bond with them, be un, understand what were important for them, and at the same time be extremely clear on the ambitions and on who had given me this mandate, and, and uh, that was probably that was something I learned uh, a, 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 big, a big lesson from that you have to sort of acknowledge uh, all perspectives and not to be a bulldozer, but uh, but do it in a way where you are able to manage stakeholders and and. Uh, and at the same time, be very clear on the mission. Mm. That was difficult. Mm. Cecilia, do you want to add something? No, I think when um, I'm a, if I talk about obstacles to my career, I'm not so very. I think maybe I'm too positive person. I don't look so much <laughs> on the obstacles, but I think that one thing that will always kind of be challenging is the whole issues around time. And um, there are times in your life where your life is work and family. And there are times in your life where you can maybe, maybe shift that balance and or maybe also get some um, of your own hobbies back into the life. But, and I think also, and again, totally with the whole corona situation where you have um, your work and life is just kind of um, have completely integrated and challenging uh, both your well-being and your family's well-being. I think just have like a really active relationship, how you set your boundaries, uh, how you organize yourself, and just, uh, what do you call it? Uh, give a damn about a few things. <laughs> and um, you have to set those boundaries myself, but I'm, I'm very lucky I'm with uh, um, my... Um, my 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 I call him my spouse my son boy he uh, he's he's like well I'm going we're going to Amsterdam this weekend I'm I'm leaving at one o'clock <laughs> so and the car is packed and you don't have to I, I packed everything for chill we're just leaving <laughs> so I think that and it works fine you don't have to like do everything you can actually just uh, enjoy the ride uh, much more than we think that we we do and instead look more at the possibilities um, in the roles that they're giving us. I have one comment to the. We've been several of you uh, mentioned, and also Mr. Cole mentioned the work hard, and I used that a lot in my uh, beginning of my career. That I had a high work capacity and that, that I worked hard. So therefore, I think I have. I don't know. I, I just don't. I like the emphasis that we need to work smart. Uh, uh, getting the, my twin boys uh, and starting a company while they were ten months and having uh, an older one as well. I, I only had the hours that I had. And that was really, it really disciplined uh, me and how I focused on what I did. I only had 40 hours a week. That's what I've been using because I didn't have it, the nights because they didn't sleep. <laughs> so I, I had to really, really work smart. Um, so we need to be a bit careful also with how we use work hard. And don't my talk opinion. about work, work hours. smart. Yeah. Sorry? Just, and don't talk about work, work hours. Work hours. Say, just like the result that you, yeah. and the value that you bring, and not the hours that you put into it. Yeah. Research, so after 50 hours, you get less uh, efficient. So exactly. That's like a magical um, number to remember. <laughs> It seems that everything is all about team spirit, that you have to collaborate with each other, you have to trust uh, your partner, and also, not at least, be open for to dare to seize those opportunities. And now, uh, Constance has been uh, interviewing some uh, other various women in different top positions. And she mentioned that she met Elisabeth Lossir, who is entrepreneur and businesswoman. Let's take a look at the interview. Nå skal vi ta en prat med Elisabeth Kloster. 
Hun startet opp og drev Safir, en ideell organisasjon som jobber med å få tidligere avhengig ut i arbeid. Og en rekke styreverv har hun også på blokka. Og nå jobber hun med stamhuset. Så la oss gå inn for å høre mer om dette, hva som skjer her, og hennes erfaring som både kvinnelig gründer, men også som leder. Hei Elisabeth, her var det veldig hyggelig. Hva skjer på Stamhuset egentlig, og hva er viktigheten deres til norsk næringsliv? Det som skjer her er at det er en arbeidsrettet mestringsarena for unge voksne og skal være et springbrett inn til arbeidslivet. Vi startet opp et par år siden uten noen klar forretningsplan, og så har vi fått med oss unge voksne og vi har fått med oss gode samarbeidspartnere i både offentlig og privat. Og i dag så kan vi sammen med samarbeidspartnerne tilby arbeidsrettet workshops og kurs og reelle arbeidserfaring, samtidig som man også kan ta jobbsøkekurs og få litt hjelp og bruke i forhold til mestring og selvtillit. Det er noe hovedene. Og så i forhold til næringslivet, så er det også et veldig godt spørsmål. Men jeg tenker at nøkkelen der er rekruttering, fordi det man vet er at næringslivet vil jo trenge oss i fremtiden å kunne rekruttere mangfoldig. Og vi har for eksempel et prosjekt hvor vi samarbeider med Norsk Design-bransje, hvor vi, om en mentor- og lærings- fordi at det de vet er at det er en blend av hvit bransje, men at de egentlig trenger mye mer mangfold. Sånn at det å hjelpe de som kanskje kunne tenke seg det, men som ikke vet at det finnes en fremtidig jobb, eller kanskje ikke blir rådgitt til det på skole, de kan da velge seg den type vei. Hvorfor mener du at Norge tjener på å ha flere kvinnelige toppledere, og ikke minst gyndere? Ofte så synes jeg det spørsmålet blir litt feil, fordi det er ikke nødvendig for at det skal være kvinner her, men det er veldig viktige posisjoner, både som toppledere og kvinnere, og da tenker jeg at det er viktig å ha mest mulig, å kunne trekke på gode hoder. Og hvis man ikke får tak i kvinner, så går man kanskje glipp av en god del av de hodene, personene som hadde egnet seg til de rollene. Det er veldig, veldig fint. Tusen takk. Elisabeth. Og til slutt, har du noen planer for grunndagen? Jeg generelt mener jo at det er flest hver dag i, men at 8. mars er jo en veldig viktig symbolstag. Så jeg kommer sikkert til å kle meg litt festivt, og så kommer jeg til å starte dagen sammen med mine kvinnelige kollegaer, som det er veldig særlig. Og så er det der at jeg tenker at vi skal alltid se tilbake på de som, det at jeg kan gjøre det jeg gjør i dag, står jeg på skuldre til de som gjorde mye før meg. Mange kvinner som har stått der, og jeg skal derfor ha middag sammen med moren min. Og hadde datteren min vært i Norge, så hadde hun også vært med på den. Og det er en litt sånn anerkjennelse av at vi hjelper hverandre frem og opp. Det er det skikkelig fint ut. Det er inspirerende. Tusen takk. Takk så bra. Welcome back to the live talk show. Uh, what an inspiring interview uh, consensus you had with Elisabeth Klostid. In this part of this talk show, I want to get to know the panelists a little bit better and who they actually are. But before we do so, Elisabeth Klostid, as we mentioned, she is an entrepreneur and a businesswoman. And you don't have to go all those steps in a large organization to become a top manager position manager you can also start your own business your own company but why do you think what do you think about that kind of pathway i guess i guess <laughs> i should answer that well it wasn't it was my plan first of all uh, i've uh, had close family members running their own businesses and i've seen how how tough it can be um so I, I really appreciated being in international, uh, multinational companies. Uh, but there was, uh, as uh, often behind stories, there was a do do door opener. Uh, my dear uh, chairman and co-founder, Marius Mele, he had founded uh, a niche consultancy company uh, some years earlier. And he, um, he started in 2015, to be honest, <laughs> to, to, uh, to, to talk to me about how much fun it was to create something on your own, um, the, the freedom, uh, the ability to, um, to, to really just set the vision and, and go there and not wait for anyone else. And I said, yes, but that's nothing for me. Okay, maybe I can join, but I will not 
be the CEO. That was my first answer. And then he said, but who will then? And I said, I don't know, but not me. And then it took, uh, and then I've told you this a couple of times, but then I got pregnant. And then I started thinking about how I wanted to use my time. And I knew that I was good at what I was doing. I knew that I still had the same dr drive, regardless of family and kids. And then I thought, why not? I'll just try. But why did you say you no know, to become a CEO in the first, w first place? <sighs> because I didn't think I would uh, be able to do it. And I didn't really have the uh, Mr. Colbrunson's, um, Colbrunson's report also say that it's the, the, the want or the wish from, from the woman that they really want to, they really need to want to do it. And I didn't really, I, I wanted to be number two. I wanted someone else to be up there. Uh, but then there was some, I, yeah, I did it. And now I, I will, I, yeah, now I won't ever go back. No, I don't know. <laughs> I'm really glad that I took the chance. Yeah. Because, as I mentioned, there is different ways to become a top manager. And uh, can we? Is there anything else uh, on becoming an entrepreneur, or or becoming a top manager in different uh, sectors or in different companies, or organization? Uh, do you want to share anything about those? What kind of pathway they are actually those women are actually taking? Well, I, I see in my network that a number of women have done that a bit later in their career. When they have a platform, they have a network, people that can help. They know where to go and get the help. Mm -hmm. And also maybe the kids are a bit older, so you feel a bit freer to, to, um, to work uh, other hours. And uh, we've all been a bit tempted uh, to have that freedom, uh, of course. But uh, I see that the tendency that people uh, with the maturity are more um, eager or, or uh, more uh, maybe also uh, sort of have more confidence that they can make it. Yeah. A bit more maturity. So I was told small kids, small problems, big kids, big problems. So then I thought it was a good idea to do it <laughs> while they were really <laughs> <You're right>. small. <laughs> but uh, yeah. No, I, I, I've been reflecting on it because, of course, when you work in big companies, you have uh, a lot of support and uh, a lot of people that you can lean on. And there, there's kind of a path uh, to the position. For me, it was a, an experience to all of a sudden just stand there and have that role. <laughs> Without kind of, I, I just it was just there, <laughs> which was uh, also obviously a way uh, because uh, it's worked out really well and we're doing great. So mm. we've done a good job together. Mm. Yeah, I think um, I think also that the the business environment in Norway has changed over the last twenty years. Uh, I um, in ninety nine two thousand and one I took. Um, an MBA at Stockholm School of Economics. Uh, the first year I was pregnant. The second year I, <laughs> I had a very, I had a, a, a toddler. But um, but if you are, if I ask my fellow students in Swedes, uh, more than half of them wanted to found their own companies. They they were at Stockholm School of Economics to become entrepreneurs. If you if you if you ask the same question here at BI twenty years ago. Uh, not so many. Mm. So I think also it has to do with the environment mm. uh, and that um, the trends, uh, and it seems less dangerous. Is you know it's 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 more um, sought of to actually uh, dare to take that kind of of risk, uh, and you have a better understanding of a safety net that it isn't a, a, a do or die if you if you're not. Successful is actually uh, uh, experience, mm. and that business climate has changed dramatically in in Norway for over the last twenty years. And I think that is one of the reasons why more people actually think that this is an actually a very good opportunity and a career way way to to start to to move to the top uh, by your own accomplishments and uh, and abilities. I just want to make a comment on that because you said something about pausing in the hesitation mm. and your first conclusion to not become the CEO. I had a call a month ago from a woman, she's early 30s, and she's also in a startup and the CEO has left and the chairman of the board had called my friend and said, well, the board wants you to be the new CEO and she has two small children. And they discussed it in the family and they have declared, no, she's not going to do it. Mm. But she, had to, she was going to call me to kind of discuss if this was the right decision. 
and we had a lot of back and forwards and what does it do and can you have a mentor what kind of boundaries can you set around the self uh, you can say to the chairman of the board I will do it but then I want this this and this mm -hmm. and she called me back the next day she had some discussions and it actually ended up her taking that role wow yeah and I was like Yes, that was really, really good. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are so many examples that think exactly as you just mm -hmm. mentioned, El Maria, and that's it's kind of an important sh story to share. So if you ever get that call, call, um, it can be a female or a male CEO, just call someone who, to discuss it mm -hmm. uh, other than with your partner, uh, because it's, um, it's possible. I totally agree, because I remember the first time I was asked to become a president for a youth organization in Europe. I was 19 at that time, and I was really nervous, because I was also supposed to study here in Oslo and study my first bachelor. And I was like, should I do it? Should I go for it? Because it's a huge organization. It's a lot of responsibilities for that as well. And I... I just as you and Maria, I hesitated a bit, but then I uh, actually advised with my dad and with some other advisors to get their feedback and some other perspectives on what I should do and should am I actually actually capable of taking that role in the future. Uh, but yeah, I actually did, uh, and I had the same uh, presidency for five years, so which I do not regret but it's just to dare to seize those opportunities which are so important mm. Mm. Uh, Ingelin uh, you have broad experience including being an executive vice president for the space to real violence division in Kongsberg defense and aerospace as well as VP position in Telenor Panasonic's avionics and is currently the director division regional business development at Innovation Norway how have you seized your various opportunities along your career journey? Uh, I think um, many times it's actually been a combination of um, what I really think I'm good at, uh, what I have passion for, uh, and um, the idea that if I don't take that opportunity, someone else will. And then I will have to relate to someone that I actually know that I can do the job better than. <laughs> so just let's go for it then. <laughs> and, and of course, there's coincidences in life that, that brings opportunity to the table. And, and, uh, and then it's, it's about grabbing them. But, but I think most of all, it's about having a very profound understanding of what you like doing. Because it's a very, very long work life and if you don't like what you're doing mm. it is going to be constantly very very lo long and hard work life and you lose motivation so for me it's been important to uh, to sort of really be um, in touch with myself and and understand um, do I like what I do do I have passion for it and of course um, does the the um, is it the reward? Is that uh, on the same level as, as you think it, it, it should be? Uh, and actually looking back to connect those dots. And, uh, and I had a very brief uh, um, period of nine months actually in a, in a larger um, uh, company uh, that do air um, pass, um, that's an airline. Uh, not to say which one, but I learned a very, very important lesson there. And that was that if you really, really, really like what you're doing and that what you like doing is the business cost center, not the core of what they do, it's very different, difficult to get... Uh, to a place where, where you get uh, acknowledgement for your results. Mm. And that acknowledgement uh, combined with, um, with what you like doing and what you have passion for and what you're good at, I think all those things actually need to, to come into place. And if you find those pockets, you will make success. And when you make success, you, you get better and better self-confidence uh, and you get better and better experience uh, and uh, you, you dare to take larger and larger opportunities. And uh, I think that's kind of what created that path for me. 
inspiring. I was just really, really listening into it because <laughs> I'm hoping just to take those uh, words with me uh, further. Uh, Janneke, uh, you have or you have senior management experience which spans in various industries, including 15 years in banking uh, and insurance, as you already mentioned. And you're currently the senior vice president of private market customer experience at Insidia. When we t- talked to you prior last week, you mentioned the importance of mentors and in your career journey. Uh, can you tell me more about it uh, on uh, what are your advice yeah. to find a coach? Well, first of all, I, I was so lucky to have my father as a mentor quite uh, for a long time and he's still alive and I still use him <laughs> as that. But that's uh, on the personal uh, side. He's a wise uh, man and I always come to him for inspiration. Uh, but first of all, I've uh, I've been fortunate with my managers. Maybe I have selected managers. I've been uh, attracted by people who are really good in their role and uh, tried to go in their foot- footprint a bit. And um, and what is really important is to uh, see how much uh, a leader, a manager, can help you just see your potential and actually help you release it. Uh, so I've tried, uh, and, I, and, and the, the two managers that I've had that have challenged me most, also pointing on things I, I did that I should do a lot better, uh, they are the one I really remember, and, uh, and I'm really appreciating what they've done to, to, to increase my professionalism and, um, and challenge me also to take new opportunities. So first of all, uh, a manager can be a really, really good source of, uh, of personal development. If you are open, daring to be to show your weak sides and, and, and have a really ambition to to get better in your leadership. But how do you actually approach to the manager uh, in order to ask for the, their advice and maybe in a later period of time ask them to become a coach? Because that's because it might be sometimes a little bit scary to ask your mon- manager for advice because you also want to sh- showcase yourself from a, uh, a, another side. So... Yeah, but I think most professional managers, they like that you're able to see your weaknesses and then you have sort of a, a, a leadership platform you want to grow into. And they're motivated uh, to help. That's my experience. And, uh, and I've also had external, an external mentor, an external co- coach that can help me see it from a third, um, third line mm-hmm. perspective. Uh, and uh, the thing there is that it's uh, you have to open yourself. You have to give and take. You have to try to also be a good sparring partner to your boss or your mentor. Then it's then it's getting a rich uh, relationship that you learn from. And uh, I've also used uh, communication advices for the management team and myself to be able to become better at uh, at uh, communicating. But. Uh what what are your advice for young people, uh, maybe my age or other students, uh, for how to find a coach uh, if they don't have a manager or but they want to become a better person and to get some advice in their work? So, I would uh, uh, show your ambition. That's important. Be uh, very clear on that you want to develop and you want to to, to move on in your career. And ask for uh, getting into a mentor program if that exists in your company, or uh, having one of the managers in uh, the company as a coach, because a lot of these senior managers really, really like to be uh, in that kind of uh, mentor depth relationship, and they find it uh, developing. So ask for it. Uh, if it's not an established program, then just ask for uh, you know you see a manager that can help you. Could I ask you to be my mentor? And uh, they will very often be very happy to do it if they see a person with potential, they see a person with ambitious ambitions. Interesting. Uh, I, I personally think it is an, there is a need to have another person, especially who you are able to discuss, who have different perspectives, because if you have a person who have different perspectives and are able to maybe showcase what you are doing wrong or come back with the constructive the critique, then you are able to improve yourself as a person and do a better job, uh, even in a you know, youth organization, student organization, or even uh, in a startup or your job. 
But I think working in complex, large organizations, I think it's important. First of all, I, I often say to, to younger uh, people that ask me that choose your leaders um, um, over actually your tasks. Because uh, if you have people that believe in you, they will help you. Uh, I have been lucky and been dragged <laughs> up um, uh, all the way and they can also help you in how to navigate and how, how do I read the system and how do I walk the structures. Um, to me also I have used mentors and coach uh, coaches, uh, not one or two in particular but several uh, depending on where I've been in my life but I, I have also been uh, very um, active in, in UDA network which is um, um, a network for women in tech, the industry that I represent. Um, I didn't think I would need a network again when I started working, but then I understood that uh, being uh, with these um, other uh, girls and women, that was actually cheering. Uh, you, you said we need to help each other, Ingelin, and and this helped me to put words on a lot of those things. I talked about the unconsciousness. Uh, it helped me to, to understand the structure. And it, I, I went to so many talks about raise your hand and walk into the room and power posing. And you, you, can, even you can laugh at it, but it actually it works. So to me, that was really fruitful. So um, I'm really happy for what the Uda has done for me. There is a need for those networks uh, where women support women because in that way we're able to empower each other and also help each other up. Cecilia, you are the first woman to become a partner in uh, company's Norwegian consulting department at Deloitte and has extensive experience from leading large transformation in public sector. In Tom's research, he mentions ruling techniques uh, and gender stereotypes. And in your blog, you're mentioning some of those. Uh, have you experienced that that other use rules of techniques towards you, and how did you handle it? I think that my <clears throat> strongest interaction with ruling techniques was actually from my when I was working as a, uh, I had an extra role as a sports politician, and uh, and I don't know if everybody knows it's around being um, ridiculed or made invisible or uh, holding back information. Uh, being labeled, pl place guilt. Um, and very often we might think about like extreme versions. We had for four years, we had Mr. Trump, you could just like his handshaking, how we address women, and you could just like have this uh, rule technique bingo, because <laughs> he used them all, all the time. Uh, I think what I have experienced, and we experience it every day, it's kind of the more secluded ones, like um, when you're in a meeting room, you raise your hand, or you don't raise your hand and you don't kind of get included, or you, you come with a point and then a man or someone else come with a point five minutes later, and when they sum up the meeting, they say, really great point made by Mr. Blah, 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 let's do that. And you're like, what? That was my point. What happened? Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that they all are conscious, uh, but they're, um, of course they might be. And in addition, we are, I think, especially today, when it comes to we don't see each other in the office, you have a lot on Teams or emails. Who do you put on copy? Who don't you put on copy? Mm. It's happening all the time um, around us. And I had a very specific, uh, this was an, in an international meeting. It was physical, so it must be more than a year ago. I could hear someone call out the, the woman who's like uh, administrating the meeting. He said, well, what are we doing now, my little friend? Mm. And I was like, what? But fortunately, one of my male colleagues from the Oslo office, he was like, seriously, we are not calling each other little friends here. So, uh, so how do you deal with it? Um, I think first you should actually learn it. There are lots of like blogs or podcasts so that, because very often when you come into a situation, you get stressed. You could feel the pulse. You don't know what's happening. And, and that was the reason why Berit Oz, the professor and politician, she kind of made them because there were five. So if there were like women in the meeting, she could like do this. Now he's using number two. So they had like like secret <laughs> way of communicating it. <laughs> so, so, but first you could just learn it from yourself. And then also kind of to be prepared and to use Donald Trump again. If you remember when he had been shaking all the government leaders, he met Justin Trudeau. And Justin had probably really prepared for this because he was like rock solid. And they were just like, how <laughs> 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 you there? It can also be like, um, when you, how do you enter a room? Where do you sit? Wear a, a red suit. Great. They will see you. When do you talk in a meeting? 
How do you kind of lean in, make your points heard? How do you improve your rhetorical skills? Uh, so I think, uh, and these techniques are used to shift the the power of um, the balance of power. So I think even though it's a very bad thing, you should all actually uh, learn it. And my favorite final point is Gro Harlem Brundtland. She had this trick about having a pin in her shoe when she was like debating Kody Vilok, mm. and he was like always calling her Ma'am Brundtland mm. was the name of her husband, not Har- Gro as her name. And she had she was like pressing down <laughs> because you can only feel pain once. And she felt it in her heel. <laughs> so so um, it's kind of a yeah, fascinating area. Yeah. But, But as I soon as you, as soon as you start to... Have you also tr- uh, experienced that from women? Because I've seen the women oh, yes. the oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. If they're in uncertain, if they're feeling incompetent, it's a way of sort of getting gaining control or... Yeah. Uh, so... Women are using that towards each other. Oh yes, yes. 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 Okay, can uh, you yeah. tell me more about it and how do you actually <laughs> yeah. handle that kind of situation? Because uh, as we're talking here, we should empower each other instead of uh, taking each other down. So, well, I think using ruling techniques is a, is, is a symptom of uh, uh, insecurity or weakness. I mm. mean, because you don't have any other better ways of getting your uh, your. Uh, Uh, arguments through in a way. So uh, I, what I have done is to keep an arm's length distance to people I know um, as long as it's possible and then not be naive, know the techniques mm. so that you can sort of act back on it in a, in a hopefully a wiser way and, 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 um, and maybe also uh, um, try to de... Uh, what, what do you call it when you, um, you, you make the weapons they use a bit less... Uh, Mm. effective mm. Mm. so you find ways of doing that actually and that you can do towards women or men because i have met both so it's not only a male no. uh, uh, attribute but have you dared to actually confront the person and said you're actually using the rules of techniques towards me now i have actually done it twice oh you have but then i did it like afterwards separate only the two of us yeah. it was a pretty heated, heated discussion but mm. uh Yeah, I think both learned a lesson actually. So, but never, of course, in public. But mm. I think if someone is like, it should, we should actually call it out. Yeah, I have actually called it out in a meeting. <laughs> in a meeting, in, public. in a meeting, and that that was a very that that debate ended very very good actually, mm. because it's something about if you can't use real arguments, then don't mm. argue. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, very often we are very prepared. And we are very knowledgeable, and there's no reason for those type of techniques. And if you put your fingers on them and put them on the mm. on in the spotlight, you know you you can end up getting a, an, an enemy for life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But then maybe it's worth it actually, mm. because then you know where you have them, and that's sometimes just as good. Mm. Oh, can you tell what happened? <laughs> <laughs> It's only the I get very five hours here. Now. <laughs> yeah. And also no, you don't actually have to. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It ended up as a very heated debate, yeah. I must say. Mm. But um, but I think that is some of the things that we should not be so afraid of. Mm. Actually, being more direct and confront. And uh, uh, you know, if you if you study. Technology, as I've done, I've been to, to Trondheim, to, uh, to Antehoa. Uh, and it starts really when you choose mathematics and physics. The cohort is, is, is small when it mm. comes to girls. And, and you're used to that jargon, way, way, that male kind of way of solving things. And that is much more often gloves off and just go in the ring and punch it out. Mm-hmm. And we're not so good at that. And I think that we should be much better at that. Gloves off, punch it off, and just dare to do mm. do it this yeah. way because um, it's fair. You know, it's much more fair to say that you know I disagree with you. Now is this and that, mm. and and I don't put up with it mm. because then you you get much more fair and open debates, and and those guys they take it. Mm. Mm. And they appreciate it, and you earn respect. I think yep. you said just one uh, comment to that: to 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 actually stand for your opinions, because I've o- often gone quite long into mm. a discussion, mm. and then you just 
back off, mm. but not cough, but s to stand in the discussion and dare to disagree mm. and say that we won't agree to this. Mm. We totally disagree. Mm. I, I practice that <laughs> yeah. every week. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think that's a good thing. And, and there's nothing wrong about a disagreement, but, but be fair and straightforward in your argumentation. Mm. And then it's uh, whether you... Uh, you ch you end up uh, whether it's a consensus or uh, some other sort of uh, reasoning that that ends up uh, that you take decisions that that you disagree in. Well, at least you you voiced your opinion, mm. uh, and that's a fair thing. And then you you're loyal to the decision in the end, of course. But but it's something about voicing your opinion and stand mm. for that instead of doing what I I actually think that we women are better than mm. the men and that is to to take the fight again right yeah. and we do it in more subtle ways mm. um, and girls we shouldn't mm. i totally agree mm -hmm. Mm. so to sum up this interesting discussion about rules of techniques and also others there is a need to one get to know what kind of rules of techniques there actually are out there. Get, uh, learn them, read about them, listen to podcasts. Call Cecilia. Yeah, call Cecilia. <laughs> <laughs> or actually read her blog. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's really interesting about the rules of techniques part. Uh, but also dare to actually raise your voice, dare to confront those people, but do it maybe privately, but also in a room of other people. It depends on what you are comfortable with. But... And Maria, oh. yeah, <laughs> you are currently the CEO of a niche consulting company, Gnis Technology Advisors. And you have prior to that 13 years of experience from large tech and management consulting companies as a director and an advisor within digital transformation. A lot of digital background, which is interesting. And you have chosen to start your own company despite the fact that you have three children. With, what is the reason for that? Yeah. Now, I have shared part of the stories. I can repeat a couple of the main parts. Uh, it was, uh, of, as always, there are many things happening at once, but uh, it was the door opener, uh, my now chairman and colleague, who, who um, uh, yeah, wanted to do this together. Uh, it was uh, the changing my uh, personal situation, uh, growing the family and, and freedom, flexibility, and actually being in charge. That just uh, felt uh, uh, more right uh, than before. Um, and I think the, the experience that I have uh, being in, in, in large corporations have given me so much value. And I actually recommend everyone who has the possibility both to try both things, uh, work in smaller companies and work in larger companies. Um, but right now, where I was in life, this was the right thing for me. And I'm so glad. I, I, I was nauseous. I was like, what am I doing? And so many people told me, what are you doing? <laughs> but I'm so glad that I trusted my gut and that I, I did it uh, because now I'm, I'm creating this company uh, which is uh, the workplace that I want to be a part of and I do it together with my, um, my great colleagues so it's been a fantastic experience and, and we're doing good uh, despite of uh, everything that has happened the, the last year. We still need more women in startup uh, companies and in that specific uh, entrepreneurial environment. And do you any of you have any thoughts on how we can actually inspire more women to actually take on those roles as you did, El Maria, to go and become a CEO of a startup uh, and also take those uh, opportunities? I see, as I uh, um, all of a sudden was a part of that myself, I see more and more females that actually do it and I meet them and I talk to them. And I think that uh, the risk and the capital part of it is, is one thing. Um, uh, I was lucky because my co-founder could take a part of the economic risk. Now I know more and I'm, I, I dare more myself. But being a first timer, that was uh, important to me. So, um, and I, again, seeing other people do it. And, and, and seeing that uh, it's, okay, what's the worst thing that can happen? You need to find another job. Mm. And in, in, in this, uh, being in a startup uh, in tech, we have 60% women. We're 14 people and 60% are women. I haven't seen that in any company so far. 
So it's it's interesting. I think. Yeah. And thank you for this inspiring panel discussion and for sharing your thoughts, your stories and your journey uh, with me and the audience out there who is uh, live listening to this uh, show. But before we actually end uh, this uh, live talk show, uh, I just want to have one liner from each of you on what is your advice for young people to reach out to top managers positions? Elin, do you want to start? Say yes <laughs> when you're presented with an opportunity. But I also think that if you really have those ambitions, plan for them. Find a path and, and, and try to sort of, when you look back, when you sort of are 25 years into your career, you can some way connect your dots and that you, you plan for those things that, that you really... Um, make your work life a good place to be because it's a life work, long work life. But say yes. Say yes. <laughs> I think that uh, remember that it's, it's a journey and enjoy the journey, not only think about the destination. I hear all this uh, CEO before 30. I think that's complete nonsense. You have to find out what you like to do and you don't know what you want to do. You have to try different stuff because if you're good at it, you will love it. So enjoy the journey and... Destination will end up any, anyway <laughs> in the bitter end. Well, I think that uh, you should uh, grow your wings by getting the expertise, getting leadership experience, and, uh, and then spread it out with the aid of network and supporters and managers that can help you. And then uh, fly as a butterfly when you get the opportunities and say, yes, I can. Mm. It's the only way, and don't let anyone box you in into a stereotypic... Uh, 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 yeah, but not just say yes. Step forward and uh, and take the position. Mm -hmm. And what's the worst that can happen? Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts again and for joining this live uh, talk show with us uh, here at Finnoyen at uh, BI. Uh, I got a really good pleasure of, uh, I was really inspired by your stories and your journeys. And I also hope that you were also inspired by those inspiring stories. Yes, you're right. This was great. So uh, thank you to BISO, BI student organization, BISO Media, uh, the streaming company Konsert Systeme, and of course, thank you to all of you that watched and joined our live show. I hope you had a really nice evening and that you learned something and now that you are actually motivated to dare to seize those opportunities. We will end this with a quote by Simone de Beauvoir who says, one is not born a woman, one becomes one. And with that <laughs> being said, <laughs> happy, happy International, International Women's Day. Day.